Hi everyone. Um, yeah, so my goal tonight is to inspire you to um, get your hands dirty and play with the tools that you use rather than just use those tools. Um, and uh, I think the most fun tools that we have to, um, to play with in this program is uh, compilers. And especially if we're statically typed programmers, there's a bunch more information in those compilers that, that we can play with. Right? Um, why would you want to do that? Um, I think there's a couple interesting reasons. I think it's, firstly, there's practical, practical things you can do once you can start to manipulate um, the, the internals of, of the compilation pipeline. You can, in Scala, you can do things like write macros, which can so generate some boilerplate code for you so you don't have to write it yourself. You can do things like, um, you know, optimize code to, to do fusion of um, collection operations. Um, you can write compiler plugins. Um, which is sort of like macros in a way, but can go at arbitrary points in the compilation pipeline. People have used those for all sorts of crazy stuff and useful stuff like writing um, static analysis tools. We're working on one called Scala Abide. There's another popular one at the moment called Water Remover. Um, and, um, you know, of course, you can also use knowledge you have of compiler internals to make the Compiler itself do something new or, or do something that it should do already, but do it better or at all. And that's kind of got what got me into it in the first place. Um, I think it's also interesting to play with the, the compiler um, just because it gives you a different and deeper perspective on the language. So, just when you're writing code yourself in Scala or in Haskell or whatever um, language you're using, um, having got your hands dirty with the, the sort of meta aspects of the the language which you have to when you're looking at the tools um, just gives you a fresh perspective about the language itself. And uh, you know, I think maybe the third reason is it's sort of it's hard and fun and it's challenging and rewarding. So, um, so I think to to go into it, you need you need some help along the way. So you need to be able to ask questions, know where to ask questions, and hopefully have someone to give you a couple answers. You need the right sort of attitude, so you need to be a little bit naive. I think that's how I got into it. <laughs> My view was that it's, the compiler is just some other dumb program that doesn't quite do what I want it to do, so let's dive in and, and make it make it do that. And, um, yeah, so with these sort of uh, traits, I think you, you can uh, get in and do some interesting things. Um, all right, so probably like the number one way just to to dive in and look at the uh, internals of the compiler is in the REPL. So the REPL is a great tool for interacting with uh, with your code, but also with the compiler code. Um, so if you have a REPL floating around, you can just type in power mode. And um, power mode will give you access to all the compiler internals. So in addition to being able to define classes and so on within the REPL, you can also get a handle on, on the um, things like the type that the compiler uses to represent that class within the REPL. Um, so I just want to give you a, a, a quick sort of whirlwind tour of the sorts of APIs that are available, and then we'll jump back into the presentation and sort of go into a bit more detail with them. Still pretty quick because I think you're all pretty sharp here, and I don't want to, you know, bore anyone. So at the end, I want to bring it into um, a useful application, and we're, we're going to write a type checker. So okay, if we've got a, if we have a type in Scala, you can sort of ask questions of this, like what, um, what are the members of the type? All right, so that's got a type. It's, you can see it's got a member X, which was that method we added to it there, so we can get that particular member. Um, I might just sit down and do this, it's a bit hard to type. Yep. Okay, so we can we can grab X, which is going to be something called a symbol, <laughs> which represents um, you know, declaration or definition within a Scala program. Um, so here we've got X. We can look at the the definition um, of that. So it's it has a type itself, 
and um, you know we can then look at some other type like we, we've been using uh, global which is an instance of the compiler so we could also look see what methods are available on global uh, I don't know any, anyone want to guess who this is <laughs> it's with a name like global <laughs> <laughs> Okay, 1567. So that, that's a small number of concepts that you need in hand to work with the Scala compiler. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, there's a few. Anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll touch on a couple of them. Um, okay, let's just say we want to find all the members of Global which um, satisfy some condition. Let's find all of the ones which are um, part of the, the class hierarchy for ASTs. So that the, all AST nodes extend from the type tree. Um, and okay, we're starting to see a bunch of different trees like this, which represents when you type, type this in the code, or select, which is, you know, foo dot dot bar at some represented as a select mode. Um, so straight away we're kind of you know doing stuff that you might have done before with an IDE or auto completion and you know, it's sort of fun just to be able to have an API to your API. Um, okay so that's just a, a flavor of what you can do. Well, the other thing you might have noticed if you used the Scala REPL before and you see this working um, that's because I'm using a little Normally it doesn't work, but in 2.11.8 we're going to merge the changes in which will make that work. Um, so auto completion has been horribly broken in the REPL for a long, long time, but we fixed it. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you even get, I think, like help. Let me get the, the definition of the signature. All right. So. Anything you want to play with at all, you can play with in the power mode. Um, okay, so the compiler is just a program, and there's a few different entry points into the compiler. Most we're usually used to using a build tool, right? We're um, using a build tool like SPT, or Maven, if you're really um, unfortunate, which has to call the compiler um, or use the command line pass options in that way. There are a couple different ways you can programmatically call the compiler. Um, uh, I'm going to start here with, with um, the compiler API, which is part of runtime reflection in Scala. It's sort of like the, you know, the best way of doing this. Um, pretty soon we'll get down to the more like low level way where you can call all the unofficial APIs as well. So um, just check if I can run this thing. Okay, so we, we saw all those different types of trees before, right? Um, so what we're doing here is constructing a tree which represents this um, method call here, print line hello. Um, so what have we got here? We've got an apply node, which uh, has a qualifier and a list of arguments. Um, qualifier here is an identifier, which has a name as its parameter. Um, names in Scala come in two different namespaces. There are term names and type names. It's um, kind of unambiguous when you pass Scala code which one an identifier is, which is sort of a handy property. Java doesn't have the same property, unfortunately. Um, so when you are looking up a member of a type, as we did before, you have, if you ask for the member which has a term name f or a type name f, um, there's, you can get two different answers, right? Because you can have um, Okay, but we're, we're up to something which is just in scope, right? We haven't given it a fully qualified name to where this print line is. Um, we're going to ask the compiler to figure that out for us. And the argument is a literal, okay. And this is just the, the means of representing a literal within scholar trees. Okay, so we have a tree there. Once you have a tree, we can do a couple of things. We 
can call uh, show raw, which gives us a. Um, is that high enough? You can see. Yep. Yep. Okay, so show raw is sort of handy when you you want to get a view of the tree, which looks more or less like this low-level view that we used to construct it, right? Um, and actually, see the names of the. the case classes which are representing this. We can also call show, which um, gives us what the code looks like. And there's an, something new in Scala 211 called show code, which is really what the code looks like, um, uh, in that it's, it's designed that you could then parse that code and, and go back to, to um, a tree, whereas show was sort of like a more of a best effort approach and showed some artifacts of the implementation. Along the way, so th these are three ways to um, to print out trees. Okay, so but we wanted to get some types, right? Because we're we're into those sort of things. So what we're going to do is um, use the runtime reflection API to create a toolbox compiler, um, which gives us a nice method here: a type check. And once we pass a tree through this method, it's going to be decorated with types. So Scala trees uh, have a mutable field on them for the type. Um, and so type checking kind of will either mutate the tree in place, or in some cases create a copy of a tree. But the end result is a tree which has a non-null value for tree.type. Um, uh, there's, there's an option to this show method that we just used before which will print the types of each node here. So um, this, so here we can see that uh, this we put in the identifier print line, but this has been expanded um, to the place where it was found, which was in the sort of magically imported pre-def dot underscore. Um, the method that has been selected is actually there's two overloads, so the compiler's picked one of the overloads, and that's of a lovely scala type any to unit. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, and then our, our literal here has a type. It's actually a constant type, it's not just string, but it's um, it actually the, the, the value of the constant is, is propagated around the compiler in the type as well, which is used to, for doing things like constant folding. And the whole thing returns unit, right? The, the result of the application. And uh, the toolbox also lets you um, kind of run further than type checking, like run the tree through the rest of the compiler, generate a class file, and you know, load that into a class loader and, and run it. Right? So it's kind of a handy way if you, you know, like got a little mini scripting application in a Scala app, you can let the users write some code and, and sort of compile it on the fly and run it. I hope they didn't call system exit. <laughs> um, Alright, any questions by the way, just, just yell them out as we go. So. Um, so, okay, trees are important, so we should look at them in a bit more detail. Um, so just jumping down to, to this one here, the, the, I guess the, the typical way to create trees is not by calling some API, but it's just by feeding in um, a chunk of, cut of text which is parsed into the trees. Toolbox compiler has got a method parse which does exactly that. Um, it's, the toolbox compiler is kind of convenient in that it, it doesn't require you to, pr to put a like a valid compilation unit in there. Right? You don't need a, a class to, to wrap your code into. It adds that for you implicitly. And so it's just easy to work with expressions. Um, okay, and again, we can we could evaluate this. Uh, okay, so hello, pub. 
parser. So let's parse this string here and um, type check the generated code and evaluated it. Um, there's yet another way to, to create trees in Scala, which is with a mechanism called quasi quotes. Um, so here it's a string which is prefixed with a string interpolator Q. And um, okay, so right now we're just, this case is more or less identical. You don't particularly see one advantage of one way over the other. But where quasi quotes come into their own is um, because you can compose trees together and you can splice trees into, into a quasi quote. So in this uh, splice tree here, we will create a, a block and we're going to uh, splice in this tree here and this tree here. And composing trees is, is much more nicer than trying to like do code generation by composing strings, right? Because you don't have to worry about do I need parentheses around this um, or do I need back, back ticks around that? Um, all these sort of syntactic quirks which um, co-generators tend to get wrong. Um, we'll, this is sort of pretty magic, right? And, uh, I'm going to use this as a bit of an example to, to dive in and say, like, how does that thing work? And, and more to the point, how would I figure out how that thing works? Question? Yep. Oh. So, well, where is it getting its configuration from? Because I, I noticed that you're calling toolbox.parse and that's got some config passed in. With the quasi quoter, is it just using an implicit yeah, so, compiler? Or? Uh, the quasi quoter is coming from this import here. Yeah. So yep. th this is, uh, I've got a, I've got a like, whole section which shows step by step how that works because, yep. because I, it, it, yep. it does look odd. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, Okay, so we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that example and look at a couple different ways if you've got some code to figure out actually how's the type checker um, processing that. And before we do that, we just finish off a little bit about what else you can do with trees. So trees have a number of um, methods on there which are kind of collection-like. You can call for each or collect, you know, to grab all identifiers out of this tree. So we, we type check that tree to make it a bit more interesting. We can um, uh, we can call exists. So what I want to do is find out does this tree um, have any calls to print line in there? Right. So that's that's like a typical thing you want to do in static analysis because maybe you want to say well you should use logging and not print line or you should use neither. So um, this this is um, one way to do it. So first of all, um, I want to look up the uh, the symbols for, which uh, represent the, the definition of the, the two print line methods in pre-def. Those are the ones that we're trying to de de detect. So I, I uh, grab the type of the pre-def module, ask for a member which has the term name print line. Um, and because terms in Scala can be overloaded, um, you need to be mindful of that, and member can give you back an overloaded symbol. See, it doesn't return a, a list of symbols, it just has a, a special symbol which represents a list of symbols if it happens to, to find an overload along the way. It's a very common source of bugs when working with the compiler is to forget that case. Right? Um, but there's enough method alternatives which kind of expands out this overloaded symbol into a list of the underlying symbols. Okay, so I've got a list of symbols here, and I'm, I've got a tree, and we're going to, to go across the tree and see if this predicate matches any nodes, and um, we're doing a pattern match in here. And I'm showing here actually a, a different use for quasi quotes, not just for constructing trees, one can use them to deconstruct trees. Okay. So this is um, shorthand for roughly different way to write the same sort of thing. And quasi quotes just let you kind of express things in the, the source syntax of the language, but, um, and it's expanding out to that by way of a, a macro. Um, okay, now the qualifier here is a tree. Uh, 
trees in, in Scala after type checking have also, in addition to the type field um, populated, they also have a symbol field populated. I'll kind of go into some examples of what that means in a, in a second. But in this case, we're going to check if, if we find any calls to something which um, should print line. And, and we find that, that the tree does call print line here. Um, these higher order methods like collect and exists for each um, kind of handy for quickly working with trees and you know, to, without having to write all the recursion yourself. Um, sometimes you want more control when you're recursing through a tree. You might want to stop at some point or you might want to do a depth first instead of breadth first um, traversal. And the compiler has sort of base classes for writing these traverser and transformer. A lot of the code, like each um, compiler phase is typically provides one or two transformers. Take some, takes the input trees at that point in the pipeline and, and produces a, a new tree. A traverser is just something which which um, recurses through a tree for some side effect, or a transformer is something that recurses through a tree to produce another tree. Okay, I'm not going to go into details of those, but you'll you'll see those pretty quickly if you start poking around in the compiler internals. Okay, so those are trees. Um, the other two usual suspects that, that you need to get your head around are types and symbols. Um, we've sort of seen a few examples of those, but uh, this is just a bit of a grab bag of what they mean, where they come from, and um, okay, so let's start with symbols. So all declarations or definitions within a Scala program sort of give rise to a symbol, right? Um, and so within within um, this code here, we've got a class. So there's going to be a symbol to represent the class C. There'll be a symbol to represent the method foo. There'll be a symbol to represent the method bar. If we um, gave it a parameter, there'd be a symbol to represent the, the parameter x. And so, kind of, uh, there's a, a super type of trees which represent things which um, define symbols called def trees. Right? And we can um, we can traverse over this type checked tree and extract all of those. Uh, so. Okay, this is the this is the output down here of the, the highlighted one up there. So class C, the food, and so on. Now, the, when you deal work in the compiler, there's a, a module definitions which contains like a bunch of um, refer references to commonly used symbols like. The, the symbol for string or the symbol for pre-def or option. So that's one way to get to get a handle on a symbol. You can also use methods on uh, mirrors. So the compiler has a thing called root mirror, which lets you look up a, a symbol for a, a class or module by a fully qualified name. There's a uh, sort of nasty null object pattern which is at play in the in the compiler internals. So there's a thing called no symbol, right? So if you look up a member that doesn't exist, rather than throwing an exception or returning a like a, a, a left with an error, you you just get back a symbol. So this is something you have to be very mindful of. Also another kind of source of bugs. So. This guy here would give us back a nice symbol. Um, there's also like a convenience here where we can call symbol of and pass in a type as the type argument. 
um, and then this will summon the symbol for, for that. And that's obviously nice because you can't kind of get it wrong, right? You wouldn't type check the, the call in that case here. So the, the counterpart to these def trees of, of trees that define symbols are ref trees, which are trees that refer to other symbols. Um, so things like identifiers, um, select, so predef.println is a select. Um, uh, imports also refer to trees. Um, so So this is a list of the ref trees within that little program we just uh, wrote up there. Okay, there's a, a reference to Myself now. There's a reference to the empty package. Um, there's a reference to the to foo, right? Because bar is implemented in terms of foo. There's a reference to c dot super init. C calling it the, the constructor of a super class. Um, but you might ask, why? Where is the reference to int? Good question. <laughs> uh, it turns out that, that identifiers or selections which um, are used in a type position after type checking, that sort of potentially big tree gets eliminated into something called a type tree. And a type tree is just has one field in it which is a type. And types are the other things that we're going to talk about on this part here. So types and symbols are sort of like very like intertwined. Um, it's part of it's a, an implementation detail of Scala that, that they're two separate things. Um, so we're not yet at the type phase. No. So so it's, we've got a um, but we we are now. Yeah. <laughs> so this definitions module has um, in addition to a bunch of you know it has a reference to common types as well as common symbols. We have int type. We could also call int class dot um, uh, so symbols have, have a, a way to go from a symbol to a type that refers to that symbol, right? So we have a symbol for, for string, the class string. Mm -hmm. But when we write string in our program, we have a type which, which is referring to that thing. Okay. And that's that's the most common sort of type that we're, we're dealing with, and that's um, that's represented in the as something called a type ref. Okay, so um, so what I've just done in this line here is used again show raw, which we we use to sort of like peer into the structure of our um, trees earlier, you can also throw in types and symbols and it will, it will um, show you the structure. So the, the structure of the type int is a type ref which is referring to the symbol int. It has no type arguments right, because int is a um, polymorphic class and it has a prefix because it doesn't just everything in Scala kind of is within something else. So it's it's Scala dot int. Right? Um, just like we use that symbol of symbol of above to um, get a handle on a symbol, we can also use type of, and that's the one that I used initially in the REPL in power mode to sort of um, get a handle on what types. Okay, so you know this. This is all stuff that um, I've got it here for reference more than anything. If you want to come back and have a look at this stuff, um, it's not. It's hard to take it all in um, in one in one sitting. Um, it's just a matter of getting some muscle memory for, the, for these different <laughs> things. 
Um, all right, but what I want to get back to is, is this question of like, we saw this quasi quote um, before, and we said, well, you know, how does that work? Get the compiler tell me what, what, what it's doing and to help me understand this, this code or this idiom that, I, that I've never seen before. So what, what you could do would be to, um, to write some code and feed it into a type checker and see what comes out the other end. So if we, um, we've just thrown a little snippet of code here and parsed it, and we're going to run it through this toolbox type checker like we did earlier, and we're going to show the result. Uh, oh, okay, we've got a bit of a, a bit of a spew of code here. So uh, that's the end result, but it hasn't sort of told us, hasn't sort of shown us working, right? It hasn't seen its steps along the way. Uh, what we can sort of see is it's calling some factory methods, syntactic applied, syntactic term ident. So it's not. There's some structure which is similar to that manual tree creation which we did back on the, the very first slide, right? Um, but I'd be interested to, to know what are the intermediate steps. So let's let's see what else we can do. Um, so the compiler has a, um, a bunch of kind of minus x and minus y options to turn on various logging and um, and that's what we're going to do now. So, you know, we've sort of surmised that this string interpolation queue thing must have been a macro because we see the end result, but we want to, to know what happened along the way. So, uh, the easy thing to do would be just to, to take that snippet of code, stick it into a, a source file, and run the command line compiler with these options. Um, just for the purposes of the demo, I'm just going to do that all within here instead. Um, so, I'm going to actually as a side effect, we'll see how to kind of create a full compiler, and the same one that, that, that compiles your code when you run Scala C on the command line. Um, so the compiler is um, an instance of this class global. To construct it, we need settings and a reporter. Right. The reporter is where errors and warnings are posted out to. So our settings, we create settings and feed in the um, the command line that we, we would have used. Um, in particular, I'm going to use here xprint, which is probably like the number one command line option that I'm using all the time to like look at the state of the AST at a particular phase of the compiler. So I want to see how it looks after the parser and after the typer. You can also say minus x show phases to, um, to get a list of all the phases. Um, and I want you to like trace the operation of the, the typer itself and the macro expansion engine. Huh? It's just it's sort of like Scala C minus kitchen sink. Uh, this guy used Java CP is, is telling the compiler to say, look at the, the class path of the JVM and add the jars that are on there into the, the compilation class path of the compiler. Right? So, the program can refer to, to those things. Um, saves you from having to alternatively put minus class path in here and, and, and feed it Scala library dot jar and so on. Um, okay, then we're going to, we've got our global. Um, if we can do anything with the global, you have to construct a global dot run. Uh, this is the, the compiler can be used in a resident scenario, like the, the, the REPL is a resident compiler, so it can compile um, you know, not, not just one batch of files, but many different runs. The IDE is using the same facility. And we're going to wrap up our code in a, in a class because the comp this compiler needs a valid compilation unit, unlike the toolbox compiler. And uh, tell it to compile their sources. Check that it hasn't spat out any errors along the way to our reporter, which is one that just buffers them into a, a collection. And uh, yeah, that's it. As a side effect, it's going to print out these trees as we go.
Okay. <laughs> so you, you have to squint when you read this stuff, but it's like, you know, that scene in the Matrix where it just starts to come out at you. <laughs> um, so just to remind us, we're, we're trying to figure out what happens when we have, when the type checker has hit this part here, right? What's, what's it meant? So first of all, we can see that syntax trees at the end of the parser um, look like this. So that's this uh, string interpolation is specified as, as a purely syntactic transformation. So identify a string is um, syntactically is just changed by the parser in Scala into string context. The uh, individual chunks of the string that, that separate anything that's dollar spliced into it, passes individual strings to this string context, um, and then dot cube, and then a varags list of any of the things that are spliced in. Okay, so that's... So now we're looking for this next part down here, which is the type of... Uh, um, the type of recursing through, through our program and, and figuring out the types along the way. Okay, so this part's kind of interesting here. Forming macro expansion for quasi quote of string context yada 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 dot q. So there's been an implicit search which has taken this string context and added an extension method q, and that was provided by this um, method by like an implicit class or quasi quote which is living in which is something that we imported um, in our program from this universe here. So that, that's where it came from. That was the configuration. Um, okay, so in summary, this is the desugaring of, of string interpolation. Um, if you look in a bit more detail, you can see that the type checker has to sort of insert this call to apply. Right, that's, that's part of its, um, its process has to find the extension method um, Q by applying an implicit conversion. Um, and then it needs to, to expand a macro, which is the quasi code. Um, yeah, okay, any questions that that gives rise to? Apart from like, what's the point of all that? <laughs> From day-to-day -day use, um, this XPrint typer is, is quite handy just to look, if you don't understand how some code is, is type checking or even just desugaring in the parser. Um, and if you're working on the compiler, sort of XPrint all is a really handy way just sort of seeing what, what does this phase of the compiler do because you see the, the trees sort of you know, change over time. As, um, they kind of become progressively more like sort of Java code basically until they're at a point where, where they can be um, emitted as bytecode. Okay, so uh, 20 minutes left. Let's try to write a type checker. <laughs> okay, so um, as I said, I, I needed um, a bit of a theme to bring all this together and but well, if you want to know what it's like to work in a compiler, then the most interesting kind of part of this is a type checker. So let's try to write, you know, our alternate version of the built-in type checker. So what I want to do is be able to feed in uh, trees into my own type checker. We're constructing them here with quasi quotes, as we saw earlier, and um, uh, this type checker just is going to give us an error if it is typed incorrect, or it'll tell us the, the type of the whole expression if it's correct, right? It's um, a bit different from the real one, which which has to sort of annotate the trees, the types of all of the, the trees kind of recursively, and you know, replace trees with some expanded trees, um, and so on. So we'll just start with something really simple, and I might need your help along the way to find all the mistakes I make, so please keep your eyes open and 
<laughs> Insidious Elf is my pair program right here. Um, I've just got a little bit of um, sort of boilerplate in place here to make things a little quicker, but the main thing we're going to be looking at is this um, pattern match here to say, okay, what do we do for a tree of this of this nature, a tree of this type? At the moment, we just throw an exception. So we can say that type checking of literal is not implemented. So what we're going to do is just follow these error messages. So the type, the type of a literal is, uh, we can grab that. A literal is a wrapper around a constant, which is itself just a wrapper around like either a string or a int or a long or whatever. And uh, constant lets us just uh, call type here, which is giving us back the right type. So that's probably our first program is type checked. Excellent. <laughs> uh, are we done? <laughs> okay, let's try something a bit harder now. We're going to ascribe the type int to the literal Bob and see what happens. Um, okay, type checking of typed nodes is not implemented. So a type description in Scala is represented as a tree called typed, which has like some expression and a tree to represent the, the type that we're checking against. So now we're going to have to recurse. Um, so let's do that. So figure out what, what is the type of extra. I'm turning this thing called state through as well, um, sort of in, in uh, anticipation of needing it. <laughs> okay, so now we want to do something like uh, types in Scala. There's like this type called error type, which represents um, an error along the way. So we're going to be first checking to see if the uh, expression here was an error, um, or if the type, if we couldn't type check either of those parts, then the whole thing is also an error. Right? Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a, the purpose of speeding things up, there's no error messages, which um, I don't know, critics of the Scala compiler would say not, it's not much worse than the current one. <laughs> just, just kidding. <laughs> Okay, let's say, then, let's say that they're both um, non-erroneous, then the condition we want to check is to say if, um, then it's, okay, so if, if the type of the, the expression, this is a subtype of the type of the thing that we're ascribing to it, then the, the type of the overall tree is the, the ascribed type. Sort of, we're, we're, we're widening the type. Otherwise, it's an error. Um, I thought you guys were helping me out here. <laughs> Notation, the kind of TPT one is the type of t tree TPT. Yeah. You have to kind of get used to the fairly obtuse uh, sort of that one's not used in the compiler, but the ones in there are much better. Okay, so where did we get to? Uh, type checking of idents now, right? So we, we need to be able to type <coughs> it. 
So we could just say, well, to do something a bit hacky to say, So we actually have an error now, and you just have to trust me that the error is for the right reason. Right? <laughs> okay, so we're doing well. So let's let's um, make life a bit more interesting. So now we want to do like one, two, int. Check if that's of type int. Right. So okay, type checking of select is not implemented. So that's the tree that we're being faced with. Um, okay, let's see what we can do. Just so can paste that in case one. Yeah. The whole thing, yeah. <laughs> uh, what, should, what should it be? Is it it? <laughs> All right, let's try to make it a little bit more general. Check the qualifier of the selection. So now we want to. Who was paying attention earlier? What, what, what should we do now? Well, so call one is a type, and we're trying to find if that type has a member with this name. Right. Yeah. And that whole thing is going to give us back a symbol. Um, and now we have to come figure out what the type is of calling that method. Um, so this gets us pretty close. So the, when you have a symbol representing a method in Scala, it might have a type which is sort of generic in a way, right? It might have um, returned an A. Um, if we're, if let's say we called you know option of, of int dot get, so the, the get method its symbol has a type which is just returning an A. Member type is what's doing the generic substitution to say well we're selecting that from option of int, so A equals int. Therefore, the the result of calling that method is is an int, not an A. Within the Scala compiler, this is also implemented as um, something called as seen from. That's sort of like the that's like the core of essence of Scala is as seen from, and member type is kind of a convenient API to use that. Um, okay, so let's see where we get to from here. Oh no, error, error, error. Let's um, see what the, what's going on here. Just got a little kind of tracing plug in here to see what's happening cursively. And, um, okay, the problem is that the type of this method is not an int, but it's it's in a way like a it's called a nullary method type. So it's a method which which hasn't yet been called. Right? So that that thing has a different type from just a, a value of type int. So, what we need to do is um, figure out when that should be called, and uh, it's when we're actually when we actually <coughs> need the thing that we type checked to be an expression. 
So depending on where you are within the, the context of a tree, um, certain constructs are valid or, or not valid. So for example, you, you can't say, based on your, your syntactic location, you might be looking for a type or, or an expression or a pattern. Right. And so the type and the, the state that I've added is what the typer has to keep track of, is like where am I and what am I trying to, to produce at the moment. Um, and within the, the type checker, this is all implemented in a method called adapt. It's also responsible for doing things like saying, well, we need an expression and uh, you've just called a method here, but you haven't provided um, arguments to that. However, it's those parameter lists of that method are implicit, so that's the point that will trigger the implicit search to, to kind of add those for you, so on. So what we can do here is say, well, the left hand, the, the expression within a type has to, we have to tell the state that we're, trying, we're actually after an expression. So let's just say we're in expression mode here. to this state to represent whether we're in that or not. And, I don't know, let's just start it out at the faults in our very top of the tree. Uh, maybe it should be true. You're not going to find out in five minutes. Um, and now, when we, after we uh, type check, we run through this pattern match, I'm letting the state have a chance to adapt the, the result um, based on the state it's in. So here we can say, if we we have a nullary method type and we're in expression mode, then we unwrap it, which is sort of equivalent to, to kind of in calling that. Okay, and now we're we're good. So oh, let's make life a bit harder. Uh, <laughs> let's see if, how close we can get to this. So now we want to call uh, sum dot apply. We're going to pass a type argument uh, here. Um, yeah. So I'm, at this point, I might just fast forward to to the thing that does this, just because we're just about out of time. And then we can just have a look at the structure of it. All the code for this is um, on my GitHub. I'll post a link on the comments. And, yep. So what we've seen is we've just progressively added more and more cases to this um, pattern match within the type checker. So type apply is like the um, something like this, right? And so the pattern sort of starts to emerge that well we need to type check this part and we need to type check each of these. Check that, that there's no errors in, in the process of doing that. Um, uh, then we look at this type that we we found by type checking the uh, the function. Ask for its type parameters. Check that that has the same length as the, the, the number of type arguments that, that have been provided, and then do some type operation in the end, which is to sort of substitute a, b, and c into the generic of the polymorphic type of foo here. Um, Apply is, you know, just sort 
the, the, the term level um, analog of type apply, the name suggests. And we go through a pretty similar, um, a similar uh, regimen here. You know, here we're also, after we've determined that we've got the right number of parameters, so there's no ar arity error, we're, um, we're checking actually that each of the arguments conforms to the formal parameter type. We should have actually done this up here to check that the type arguments conform to the, the bounds, the declared bounds. And, uh, and I guess uh, if I roll back to the right spot, we should. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we see here that this whole thing is type, type correct. Right, so we've just implemented a little toy type checker for a subset of Scala. We can do with the Scala expressions only. We haven't gotten into the details of how you would allow scopes and definitions and you know classes and those sorts of things. But you know, it just shows you that you can get in and play with it and try. And um, yeah, I encourage you to, to do so. And um, we'll post a few uh, links to, to some resources and, that you can read up on. And uh, to our Gitter channel where you can jump in and ask any questions of us. Uh, we're always happy to help people who are trying to tinker and, and contribute. So that's it. Uh, probably not a huge amount of time for questions, but I guess one or two. Why do you uh, test some of these things? Like obviously you've done a few kind of variations here. Let's say for Scala compiler, do you have like a multi example code that you run through it? How do you yeah, so there's a couple of layers of, of testing. Um, the, the one that has probably the most coverage is we have a bunch of just programs that either should type check or should not type check with a given error message or should type check and run and, and produce some result. So we've got you know, like a couple thousand of those ones which run at every commit. Um, we, we've been introducing the last year or two more unit testing of the these individual lower level building building blocks along the way. Um, and then we do sort of integration testing in a way. So we, we take like about a, a couple dozen big open source projects and we run those through the new compiler every day just to check that we haven't regressed in compiler or library. Um, that's that's what we refer to as a community build. Instead of doing the explicit recursion there, could you have used one of the traversals of the transformers? Um, or is that really? You, you would have to, the problem is to thread this extra state down yeah, through it. So you, really you might have to, you probably could do that and keep that on the side as a That's side something. effect, but. It's better to. Yeah, you would need like the, the, the transformer ideally <coughs> was generalized yeah. enough that, that you could thread state through it. Um, the tra transformer doesn't give you that out of the box. Okay. So the, 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 actually, the, the interesting part of the state that we didn't kind of get far enough to motivate mm -hmm. was um, the, that uh, the type checker passes down something called the expected type. Um, so basically, like if you say def x of int equals blah, um, int is the expected type when type checking blah. So if, if blah doesn't conform to int, the compiler in this adapt method will sort of say, well, let's try an implicit conversion. Yeah. Or when it, if it has to do um, do type argument, um, yeah, to type argument inference, this expected type is also important, right? To say we yeah. infer types that would make this type correct with respect to an expected type. Okay, well thank you Jason.